This is episode number 177 of the Mixology Talk Podcast. And we are continuing our conversation around spirit-free cocktails, mocktails, virgin drinks, whatever it is you want to call it. I don't think we've actually landed on the name uh, for these style of drinks in the industry, but basically really interesting, very thoughtful adult beverages that aren't just sugar bombs. Um, so who better to have that conversation with than the brand ambassador for Seedlip? Um, this is the number one base spirit alternative, if you will, for um, non-alcoholic drinks. Um, and she's gonna give us some tips, tricks, and advice on crafting really interesting um, spirit-free cocktails. Now, this didn't come up in the interview, but if you're looking for inspiration for drinks in this style, I highly recommend checking out their website. I know they have a book that's really highly acclaimed in this category as well. Um, so they have some great resources for inspiration around um, spirit-free drinks. So without further ado, I hope you enjoyed this interview. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Mixology po uh, Talk podcast. Um, so as you all know, uh, this is non-alcoholic, spirit-free, virgin cocktail month, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I couldn't ask for somebody better to interview and to give us some guidance in this area than uh, someone from Seedlip. So thank you so much for joining us, uh, Laura Lashley, right? Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So um, did I get the intro right? You're Seedlip yeah. brand ambassador? Yes, I, I, I think all these titles and words are kind of, everybody uses them differently. But um, but yeah, I basically started with Seedlip uh, pretty much right when they launched in the US, so almost three years ago. And I'm based in LA, but I go kind of wherever I'm needed in the US and I, I handle our trade advocacy and uh, education. Perfect. And so before we kind of go down the road of talking about application and uh, how to basically create a spirit free cocktail, um, can you give us a little bit of backstory on kind of the creation? Like what inspired this? Like what's the kind of the root of its creation? Yeah, I think um, whenever I say that Seedlip is a non-alcoholic distilled spirit, I usually get like kind of a blank, like what? Um, I love that there's, you know, more awareness being kind of put to the non-alcoholic category. Obviously, like having a month dedicated to spirit-free NA cocktails is a great example. Um, but I think the idea and the concept of Seedlip is still a little bit confusing, which is totally fair. It's a brand new idea. Um, but basically, uh, the product was founded by Ben Branson, who... Um, is from the UK and he about five years ago um, was, and he actually, he has an interesting background. His family has been farming in uh, Northern England for about nine generations. So over 300 oh, wow. years. Um, so super agricultural like upbringing and he feels very connected to nature and to farming and the land. And that's like a big part of who he is. And consequently, of course, a kind of a big part of what Seedlip is. Um, but really the inspiration and the, the beginning of the seeds of Seedlip uh, happened about five years ago. He was playing around in his herb garden, growing some rare herbs and plants. And he kind of wanted to see if there was anything uh, he could make a little out of the box or out of the ordinary. So he started doing some research and his research led him kind of down a rabbit hole to this book called The Art of Distillation that was published in 1650. Um, so super old. I've actually held, we have, um, he tracked down a first edition copy. So we actually have one at Seedlip and you have to wear white gloves to hold it. It's like older than our country. It's very crazy. Um, but it's a cool book and it has a ton of like really weird old timey recipes in it. Um, but amongst the alcoholic distillate recipes in this book, there were non-alcoholic recipes too. Um, and mostly at the time this book, the stuff in this book was being used as medicinal tinctures and, um, he really, it really piqued his curiosity because he was finding that going out to eat and drink um, in London, going to Michelin star restaurants and really cool bars and, and constantly sort of whenever he was asking for something non-alcoholic being given like a Shirley Temple or a weird look from the server or whatever, and just kind of not getting that experience that he was hoping for. So kind of like those two things came together and that's really where this idea to create a non-alcoholic spirit started. So yeah, that was almost five years ago. And now we are in 25 countries around the world. We have our main offices in London. Um, and then we have a team in LA. Um, but yeah, like that's kind of how it all how it all came about and how we got here. Yeah, and it's interesting. I went to I think you guys hosted a um, 
talk at Tales of the Cocktail like three or four years ago, I want to say. Um, and that was the first kind of introduction I got to your product. And it was really amazing. And in not only the product, but kind of the mentality around non-alcoholic, because um, correct me if I'm wrong, in my experience anyways, it was always kind of an afterthought. Yeah. Um, this is something I've heard a lot. This is something I personally have um, been experienced to of, you know, you get that ticket that comes in a window and all of a sudden you have to scramble and you're like, all right, I got pineapple juice. I got orange <laughs> juice. I got some cranberry juice because it's got to be pink or red. Right. Yeah. And I got simple syrup and, you know, you're looking around for all these like interesting syrups to make something different and interesting. And it always turns out to be kind of this almost overly sickly sweet drink, you know, completely unbalanced in comparison to the rest of the beverage menu. So it almost seems like out of place or almost an afterthought. So um, the the mentality around being very deliberate about a non-alcoholic uh, or spirit-free menu uh, was really kind of a, a mental shift for me. And it really opened up my eyes of like, okay, kind of the same thing with Ben um, that you were saying, like you want to be able to provide that really cool guest experience for somebody that's coming in if they're drinking alcohol or not. Um, yeah. I mean, that was always my experience too. I think as a bartender, I, before I worked for Seedlip, I was bartending in New York for about 12 years mm -hmm. in a variety of cocktail bars and restaurants and like different settings. And I had the same sort of feeling like whenever I would get, you know, a ticket or a server would say, Hey, can you make a non-alcoholic drink? It's kind of like roll my eyes a little bit internally <laughs> because I was like, Oh God, like, I'm stressed. I have a lot of tickets. What do they like? Do they like ginger? Like, and I realize now that that like in, that little internal eye roll I was doing was probably like a little bit of embarrassment that I knew I didn't really know how to make anything super cool or that I didn't have the tools or the time to like give that person the kind of experience they deserved. And everything I kind of could do was basically like a fancy lemonade. Um, and I Pretty think, much, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that, you know, I think now there's been so much incredible shift around that idea um, I was talking to Josh Harris from Trick Dog mm -hmm. once about this topic, and he was like, I just want as much thought for the non-alcoholic stuff as there is for the other drinks on the menu. So whatever that looks like and whatever the establishment looks like is different, but I just want to see the same level of care and whether that's, you know, that should be everything, the flavor, the name, the glassware, like I just want to see as much effort. And I think that's a really cool way to think about it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the... The drinks that were served at that um, Tales of the Cocktail seminar were absolutely fantastic. Um, and I will say that if you're <laughs> deliberately creating a non-alcoholic cocktail, it's a lot more challenging than most people think. Yeah. Because you yeah. can't rely on the alcohol. It's kind of your backbone. You really have to adjust all of your templates um, accordingly. Yeah, that's, I think, um, personally, making cocktails my technique was always to kind of draw inspiration from the spirit base and then... Mm -hmm go from there. And I think that is a lot, how a lot of people think about cocktails. And, um, it's hard when you take that alcohol away, you're like, okay, where do I start? And how do I make it interesting? And how do I make it balanced? And I think that's something that is really cool about Seedlip. Cause in, in addition to getting the guest experience of the beautiful bottle and having the drink made in the same way as somebody getting another craft cocktail, um, you do get to play with those flavors and you do get to have your creativity like sparked by the base, which is the Seedlip. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, bartender, and what got you interested in actually working for Seedlip? Because that's a pretty significant jump. Yeah, I um, I was bar managing at the Ace Hotel. <clears throat> sorry, the Ace Hotel in New York for almost four years, and I just kind of had a little bit of burnout with the schedule and the hours and the time. And um, you know, I love bartending, but. I knew I knew I needed to kind of make a change or do something new, and I just didn't know exactly what it was. So my husband and I decided we were going to move to California and just like shake everything up and see where like throw everything up in the air and see where we landed. Uh, so we kind of like I quit my job. I didn't have a plan. Uh, I was going to drive out west and like figure it out. And then uh, I got a call from a, an old friend that I had worked with um, at a bar, and she was had gone on to work for Moet Hennessy in the UK and had coworkers who were now part of the Seedlip team. And they were building up the sort of beginning team in the US. Um, and just she thought of me and my name kind of landed in like the right place at the right time. And I took the interview knowing that I was moving and I didn't know that I would be able to actually take the job. But after I had tasted it and listened to kind of like what this company was all about, I was so excited and inspired. Um, Cause it was just different. And I think that is like 
definitely like the challenge, but also the fun thing about working for Seedlip is this is like a new category. It's an unknown territory. It's an unknown product. There's a lot of work to do, but it it's really exciting stuff because nobody, nobody knows where we're going, which is great. Yeah. And it's got to be one of the most um, frustrating things and most exciting things uh, yeah. <laughs> of kind of breaking down the boxes that people like to put stuff in. And sure. saying, hey, it's not really like that. It's kind of like this, but um, it's also part of the excitement. You get to educate them and kind of, you know, open their eyes to a whole new experience, which is pretty cool. Yeah. That's actually like one of the most rewarding parts of the job is, you know, encountering someone and sometimes having an attitude like, oh, it's non-alcoholic, I don't care about that, or, oh, that's, you know, that's dumb, that, that's, that's not a spirit, or whatever the, you know, the thing might be. Um, I get to see people kind of change their minds in real time a lot, which is really rewarding and super cool. Yeah, so you must get a lot of the similar questions then, like when you introduce this product to, to bartenders or even just um, general population. Um, so what are some of the most common questions that you get and kind of some of the biggest pushback that you get about um, the, the initial introduction to it? Yeah, I think the most common, I mean, obviously the most common question is like, what's a non-alcoholic spirit? And like, why can you, why you call it a spirit if there's no booze? That's that doesn't make sense to me. And that right. is a totally understandable reaction. I think I probably thought that too when I first heard this idea. Um, but I think what's really cool about it is we call it a spirit for a couple of reasons. One being that we want people to understand that it is the base of the drink. Like it's the base spirit. Um, it's not a mixer. It's not a modifier. It's like part of how we kind of educate people on how they're supposed to use the product is by calling it a spirit. Um, and then also to just kind of, um, pay homage to the fact that there is distillation in our process of making the liquid. So even though it's not alcoholic distillation, it's, um, and it's not exactly the same process as you would, um, you know, use for something like a gin or a whiskey, it's still, we are distilling, we're using really quality ingredients. It takes a lot of time. There's a lot of care that goes into the liquid itself. So those are kind of the, the main reasons we actually call it a spirit. Absolutely. So this, um, if somebody wanted to make a version of this at home, this is not a matter of pulling a bunch of extracts off a shelf, <laughs> throwing them in a bunch of water. There's, there's a lot more to it than just that. Yeah. I think one other pushback or that kind of thing I get, especially from like really creative bartenders sometimes is like, mm -hmm. I can make this, um, to which we say like, awesome, go ahead. Back like, definitely. <laughs> um, I think, you know, but the idea is too, that uh, we don't, we've done the work, like it's shelf stable, which is something that is really hard to do with non-alc. Um, so yeah, you can make, you know, a hydrosol or you can make an infusion, but without the booze, those things change flavor and turn and go off really quickly. So a lot of what's special about Seedlip is all the effort we've put into making sure that it's like clear and that it shelf stable. You can, you know, work with it like you would any other spirit, leave it on your back bar, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and that's a pretty significant challenge, I imagine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> than it looks. Yeah, than absolutely. <laughs> so this kind of um, goes right into the to the area about co cocktail creation, um, and I think we kind of touched upon this a little bit in the beginning of the interview. But um, we said it was very challenging to kind of do a mental shift um, yeah. for cocktails into spirit-free cocktails. What are some of the biggest challenges that you've seen? Um, creating a spirit-free cocktail? I think that um, the flavors that we often get from alcoholic cocktails, like bitterness, like tannins, things that are, um, you know, almost not caustic, but almost like, you know, give you a lot of, you know, feeling on your palate, those particularly bitterness, those things are really hard to find in non-alcoholic ingredients in like the ready-made form. So usually when you're looking at juices or sodas or whatever, they, they have kind of a two note, um, you know, you can drink it in five seconds. You can, you know, it's thirst quenching. Um, and then the difference with an alcoholic cocktail is that you want to savor it and it like slows you down and the alcohol kind of gives you complexity and lasting experience. And I think creating that in an NA drink is pretty hard. Um, and it's something that I've talked to a lot of great bartenders about, like, you know, some people like to use, chilies or, you know, heat to do that with their NA. Um, other people like to rely on, you know, things like bitterness, gentian, you know, teas for tannin. Um, and all of those ingredients, I think, um, are really fun to play with. But 
the thing that's great about Seedlip is that there's this like base foundation of complex flavor and there's unusual ingredients. Like for example, in the garden 108, um, you know, it's got peas, hay, spearmint, rosemary, thyme, and hops. So you're already starting with this foundation of flavor that's not like, you know, just juicy or fruity. It's got complexity um, and it's got a little bit of funk to it. So it, it has those like grown up adult flavors. And I think that is what people should really kind of play around with when they're thinking about non-alk is like, how do I give people the same experience and not just make them like, you know, a thirst quenching soda basically. Sure. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the weaknesses I have when I'm creating a non-alcoholic um, cocktail of some form is I rely heavily on effervescence. Uh, yeah. I mean, effervescence, effervescence is great. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, like that is definitely part of, you know, part of our palate and like experience, but how do you make a stirred non-alcoholic cocktail? Like that is something that I think, um, you know, I still wrestle with, like, it would be great if we had, you know, tons of NA bitters to choose from that were truly non-alcoholic and all these things. But without that, you know, relying on texture, I think is really important. So considering like weight and texture in cocktails, I just try to break down all the things I enjoy about a good cocktail, whether it's alcoholic or not think about what those things are. And then usually it comes down to texture, balance, acidity, bitterness, tannin, um, you know, and kind of like figure out ways to create those experiences about just relying on alcoholic products. Absolutely. And I think that is to your point, a very extremely difficult th thing to do without just adding a bunch of sugar in for mouthfeel. Like yes. that's, that's such a crutch. I think yeah. that uh, I know I've been guilty of too, um, but creating something that's long lasting and is really interesting to drink um, to your point is really, really difficult. And I love the combination of flavors that you put in here. Peas, hay and hops are the one that kind of jumped <laughs> out to me. Um, and I could see kind of that, that funkiness from the hay and the, and the hops potentially coming in there. Um, it sounds like a really fun and interesting product to work with. Yeah. This one, the garden in particular is really fun because mm -hmm. it's super versatile. I think it, when you taste it, so all the seedlip products are designed to be mixed. I should say that like first and foremost, they're all um, zero sugar themselves. Okay. And then, you know, like you were just mentioning, it is really hard to create layers of flavor in non-alcoholic drinks without just adding and adding and adding sugar. So Ben really wanted to create a product that put the sugar into the hands of the bartender and not, sure like, oh, you're already starting with a bunch of, you know, a bunch of sugar content in this. So now if you add a syrup or a shrub or whatever, it's like just layering on sugar. Um, so I think that's really re refreshing because it gives you, you know, more leniency with your other ingredients and you don't have to worry about it getting like super, super sweet really quickly. Um, but yeah, the, you can make the garden, you can, it has a savory note when you taste it. And I think if you want to use it in like a dirty martini application, or you want to play around with like you know, savory cocktails or Virgin Marys or anything kind of in that realm, the garden works really well for that. But mm -hmm. also you can make it really friendly and refreshing. It's delicious with like fresh berries. It's great with cucumber and mint. So you can like really kind of choose your own adventure with how, you know, how that product in particular you want to like which characteristics you want to play with. Yeah. And can you go through your catalog real quick um, yeah. and just kind of describe some of the key points on um, the flavors on each one? Yes. So this is the this guy is the garden 108. Okay. Um, so like I said, uh, peas, hay, spearmint, rosemary, thyme, and hops. Mm -hmm. The 108 is actually so all of our all of our bottles have like a number on them, and it's a fun fact about whatever our lead botanical is. So for the garden, the 108 is the average number of days it takes from the time you plant a pea until the time that it's ready to be picked. So that's that one. Um, this is our seedlip grove. This is our citrus. Mm -hmm. um, and this one is blood orange, bitter orange, and mandarin orange mm -hmm. with lemon, lemongrass, and ginger. So super citrusy, really fresh and light. Um, and then this guy, the spice, is the sort of very first seed lip, um, the OG. And this one is uh, made with Jamaican allspice berries and green cardamom. Those are kind of the two really prominent flavors. And then uh, lemon, grapefruit, American oak bark and cascarilla bark. So cascarilla is like an ingredient um, that's in like a lot of Amaros and Campari has cascarilla. It's like a Caribbean, the bark from a Caribbean shrub has kind of like a nutty cola flavor. Mm -hmm. So this one is really aromatic and warm and kind of earthy. Um, so yeah, they all have a kind of completely different profile and a different 
you know, place in, in the non-alc cocktail family. <laughs> sure, and I know this is probably a common question that you get. Um, do these fit in similar spirit buckets? So like if somebody was going to grab um, the OG version spice, um, would this be an equivalent to like a bourbon or like a aged rum? Um, yeah, it's a really good question. Kind of a common thing a lot of people ask. Yeah, I think people kind of want to know like, hey, how do I work with these? Or what? how do I make, how do I substitute these in like formulas and recipes that I already know? Mm -hmm. um, and we don't, specifically like call them like we don't call garden the gin one or sure. you know spice the rum one because once you kind of say that you're like a fake something or a faux something it's just like ah oh, like that's not as good um and also we just we don't want to be the veggie burger of like whiskey or anything like that um, that's so funny <laughs> we actually made the same exact analogy on a facebook live a couple of days ago that's really funny yeah, I, yeah it's just like as soon as you say oh we're the faux and, you know, it's just not quite as good as the original. So yeah. we really want them to have kind of their own identity. But um, we do recognize, obviously, that like there are certain flavor characteristics about each of them that play well, um, you know, where others like traditional alcoholic spirits do. So I often use the garden in things that would normally have like a tequila or a gin base, just because okay. of all the kind of green, fresh, savory notes, even like somewhere you might use a cachaça or an agricole because it has kind of that grassy savory quality which i really like um the spice obviously has you know all spice oh kind of like whiskey and rum characteristics so i think you can kind of play around it works really great in like tiki tropical drinks because oh, cool. of the all spice profile so i really like making fun sort of tiki inspired things with the spice um and the grove is really versatile i think like almost the way you would work with the vodka, but also it works great in low ABV drinks. Um, mm -hmm. So if you wanted to throw a little vermouth or sherry, um, oh, I've, had cool. great, I've had great low ABV cocktails made with the citrus because it has that kind of like subtle, and we use just the peels of the citrus. We're not using like the, the juice. So it has that kind of like cool, bitter citrus quality. And I think it, it plays really nicely in those like low ABV drinks, but um but yeah, I mean, we don't give it like a direct comparison, but I think for any like sour or any kind of drink where you're using a base spirit and then a sweet and a sour, the ounce for ounce substitution for these guys is pretty straightforward. Like you can use about two ounces of seed lip as your base. The only thing that's different for me when I make like, let's say a gimlet with the garden is it instead of using maybe three quarter lime, three quarter simple, like I would if I were making a gin gimlet, um, I pull back. The citrus a little bit to account for the fact that there's like zero sugar in the seed lip itself so it sure. just kind of overall balance usually needs a little less acidity um than you would need with like a, with an alcoholic spirit great that's actually really great advice um for kind of backing away the acid on that um i was going to ask you something oh i i really like the approach that you take with this because even though it is a non-alcoholic spirit that doesn't mean you can't use alcohol in it. And I know that some uh, people may kind of shy away from that idea, but um, low ABV is a really great way to kind of have the complexity and be able to have a, a handful of drinks, um, you know, without getting completely bombed. Um, so that's a really cool idea about using this as a way to kind of like lower the proof in a drink um, yeah. to make it a little bit more enjoyable too. We definitely are super flattered whenever people like the flavor of seed lip so much that they want to mix it into a low ABV cocktail or put it into an alcoholic cocktail. I think, you know, our mission first and foremost with this is to provide a great non-alc alternative, but mm -hmm. obviously, yeah, like you said, like lowering the proof of something, um, but still not sacrificing flavor, I think is, can be challenging. And these are a really great tool for that, for, for low ABV for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then with, the uh, ingredients, the, um, the bases that you have here, do you have a favorite? I'm not supposed to have a favorite drink. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, do yeah, you have a favorite like drink the, you like, like to garden. have? The garden. The garden is my favorite. Okay. I and how do you like drinking that? Yeah. It's, it's funny, though, because when I ask people, you know, when I present or taste a group of people on these and, like, ask people to raise their hand about who's which, which favorite is which, um, you know, people tend to be a pretty even split between the three. Mm -hmm. um, some people really appreciate the citrus and like really like that crisp sort of refreshing thing. And some people really love the, 
like dusty kind of earthy quality of the spice. But I personally just think the garden is super versatile and it's really unique. I've never had another, I've never had this flavor basically in any other way. So I think that makes it like, I can really taste it shine through when I taste it in cocktails, which I think is why I love it. I'm excited. I love peas. Um, yeah. I love pea cocktails. It's a weird one. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so great though, because uh, it's so fresh uh, and it's so tasty that um, I'm really excited about it. Um, and how do you like drinking it? What's your favorite way of having garden? I have two, probably two answers to that. Mm-hmm. Um, I love tonic water. I'm a huge fan of like premium quality, delicious bubbly tonic. Um, so I love just the garden with just a great tonic water. Um, you know, elderflower tonic water is really, really good with it as well. Um, for kind of like a fun summery thing. Mm -hmm. And it just is really refreshing. I think the tonic, you know, there is a little bit of sugar in tonic, obviously, but the crispness of the seed lip itself really dries it out. And so you have this cocktail and you get to the end of it and you don't feel like you, you know, you're having like an overloaded palate from the sugar. Um, But I also love just like the most easy drinking fun um, option, which is just like an East side. So this is kind of my introductory. Whenever somebody's like, I don't know about this seed lip stuff. um, I make them an East side. So I use two ounces of the garden, uh, three quarter ounce of simple half ounce of fresh lime. And I just throw some cucumber and mint in there. Um, So it's super easy. And every bar has that stuff. And, you know, most consume, most people have that stuff in their kitchen. So it's really easy to make. And it, it just kind of shines through and shows you like how easy it is to make a cool, satisfying NA drink. So those are my, those are my faves. Awesome. Yeah. We actually uh, just made an East side a couple days ago. We had some cucumber water left over Oh, nice. uh, from, I think we were making dinner. I can't remember what it was, but yeah, we just threw that in there, muddled some mint and it was, oh, it was so good. <laughs> You've got extra mint laying around that's kind of going bad or like I have bought a bunch of fresh herbs in the, you know, in this moment in time, I have like, mm-hmm not as many uses for them. I see my fridge kind of starting to go. Um, I use the stems from the mint leaves to make like a mint simple syrup. And then I just make East sides with that. Oh, use cool. The, use the leaves for like other cooking or for garnishing, but yeah, great that's idea. My, yeah. That's my fun, fun mint trick. <laughs> nice. Love it. <laughs> so when you're doing, um, non-alcoholic cocktails when you're working with seed lip is there any kind of special, um, tools or techniques that you like to, to utilize to really kind of, get the best cocktail at the end. Yeah, I think, I mean, if you want to get like pretty labor intensive and a little geeky, I think um, you can do really fun milk punches with seed lip. And I think it adds like a great um, textural element that sometimes is otherwise, you know, lacking in NA. I think um, that has been probably the most fun cocktail that I've created with seed lip was for our, um, when we launched Grove, we had like a rooftop launch party and I made a milk punch um, with like chai tea and a bunch of other pineapple, a bunch of other fun stuff. Um, and you know, had to do a lot of filtering cause I don't have a centrifuge in my, or, you know, any other fancy things. But I think if you have even just like nut milk bags and you want to clarify a little bit, um, you know, at home that way or in your bar, um, I think that clarification and, and milk punches are really fun with these. Um, another tool I really like to lean on for texture is just egg whites and aquafaba. I think, um, it's a really simple way to kind of bring that texture element up in a non-alk drink and to give that presentation sort of wow moment for a guest. Um, so, you know, I, aquafaba, I think works really, really well, um, with these. So I like to kind of use that, that fun stuff too. Perfect. Awesome. If we actually have some aquafaba in the fridge, so I yeah, but like everybody can try. make like make hummus with your chickpeas and then save the water and you can use it for use it for cocktails. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you don't want to waste it. I mean. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then when you do your aquafaba, do you, is it kind of a one to one relationship with egg whites? Yeah, I usually use about I mean, if you're using the canned stuff, I think mm-hmm. about three quarters of an ounce of aquafaba per drink usually tends to work for me. Um, but you can play around with it. Luckily or unluckily, um, these froth even better than an alcoholic cocktail. So oh, cool. you don't actually like, because there's no booze to kind of cut that foam down. Um, you don't necessarily need as much egg white. Like you can kind of get away with like a half per drink or maybe mm-hmm. a half ounce. Um, so yeah, play around with it, but, um, they're fun. They're fun to shake and get, get the, you know, the foam and all the fun. So you're saying this is like the perfect vehicle for like a gin or a Ramos Fizz. I have actually, that's funny you mentioned that. I had an amazing uh, Ramos 
fizz variation uh-huh. um, in Washington, D.C. at the Columbia Room with um, the Grove. It was delicious. So, yeah, oh, wow. totally, total fun, fun N.A. Uh, fizz options are <laughs> They abound. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, very cool. So um, when you're working with Seedlip and you're trying to create spirit-free cocktails or even low ABV cocktail, what is the biggest piece of advice um, that, you, that you would give to anybody that's kind of starting off on this? I think um, first and foremost, I think you, going back to that idea of just putting as much thought into your NA section as you do any of your other cocktails, I think, you know, you guys – you know your guests, you know what people like. I think giving, thinking about what people like in their drinks, not just thinking about if it's going to get them drunk. I think the same principles apply. Um, so really using, you know, unusual flavors for inspiration or flavors that you're passionate about for inspiration. And then, you know, paying attention to all the little details of the guest experience, I think really makes people feel special. It's, it's my, it's what really speaks to me, I think, as a bartender about these products is being able to like extend that hospitality to people that aren't drinking and really make them feel welcome and feel like they just got, you know, as much of an expression of your craft and your bar program as anybody else would have. So I think, you know, thinking about little tiny things like the glassware, where on the menu the drinks live, I think if they're always in the back in the kitty section, it, that kind of psychologically impacts the guest. Um, so just, yeah, just being thoughtful, I think, and, you know, being thoughtful and, and opening your mind, you know, and thinking, okay, what are the things, what are the things I like about a cocktail? Not just like, okay, I'm going to substitute, you know, Seedlip or some other product in, or I'm just going to leave the the rum out of this mojito and make an NA mojito. I think like really considering what all those touch points are for a guest and, and what they're going to enjoy and just, you know, being really mindful about all that stuff. Well, absolutely. And I think that's all great advice. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and once again, thank you for your time. Now, before we go, uh, is there anything that you had, you guys have coming up um, that you guys are excited about new product launches or any kind of new initiatives you guys are launching uh, on your end? Uh, yeah, we, um, we are doing some really fun stuff with our social media platform right now. So um, all of our global brand ambassadors have contributed to a masterclass uh, series on IGTV, making different cocktails with Seedlip. Um, and they're all pretty simple, but it's like a good place to get started if you're just starting to think about NA and kind of like what works and what's fun. Um, so that's really exciting. You can check it out on it. We, we kind of release a new one every Thursday, but they're all archived on our Instagram. So you can check out those cool um, masterclasses. And yeah, that's kind of, kind of where we're at. Um, we've got some really fun stuff in the works, but... I'm not allowed to talk about it yet. So <laughs> when we get there, um, I would love to chat with you again and I'll tell you about all about in more specific detail, the, the cool stuff on the horizon. I think I saw some of it uh, through our correspondence and I know I won't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> but no, is- I can say, I can say we have a really cool line of non-alcoholic products, kind of a sister brand that has launched in the UK um, called Acorn. Mm-hmm. So they are, um, really exciting fun I think they're going to add a bunch of value to like the tools that we all have for the NA kind of experience um they're Verjou based so really oh, cool. cool kind of like different than Seedlip um sister brand and they are coming hopefully very soon to the U.S. so you know when that happens um you guys will hear about it and get get bottles to try and all that kind of stuff. And I think it's such a good compliment because I was lo- actually looking at it um before a conversation and through the correspondence and I think it answers a lot of the questions that people have when they talk about NA. Like it gives you kind of a much bigger palette to pull from. Yeah. Um, so when that happens, we'll definitely have to talk because yeah. <laughs> I'm very excited about it. We it's just fun. made a couple of uh, Verjou cocktails a couple of days ago. And uh, it, it's it's so, such a great and interesting ingredient to play with and pull inspiration from. And I don't think it gets a lot of recognition uh, as a bar ingredient. Well, it didn't when I was standing bar a couple of years it's ago. It's definitely ago. one of my go-to. Like I lean on Verjou um, all the time when I'm mm-hmm. making uh, just for that, like a little bit of acidity and a little bit of, you know, that grape based experience. Um, mm-hmm. The Acorn products have, incredible flavor profiles and are really complex and super, super interesting. Um, and they kind of broaden, I think the occasion when you can drink a seed lip or drink, you know, it's just because you're not drinking doesn't mean you don't want that like 5 PM end of work day drink that aperitif or that before dinner drink or after dinner drink. So we're really trying to kind of 
bring some new tools and new occasions into the conversation so that there's just more fun stuff to play with. Absolutely. And I, I'm, I got to say, I'm, not, I'm very excited about when that uh, gets released and uh, we'll definitely have to have you back on to kind of oh. talk about it, <laughs> applications and kind of geek out on some of the, the, the fun stuff about it. Uh, but once again, I can't thank you enough for your time and kind of sharing your knowledge and expertise uh, with us. So thank you so I'm much. Thank you for having me. So once again, thank you to Laura Lashley for offering up her advice and experience around crafting spirit-free drinks. Um, I know I definitely learned a lot and hopefully you guys did as well. So we'll have some more shows like this for you in the future. But until then, I hope you guys are safe, having some great drinks at home, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Cheers, everyone.